this computer, sure. All right, so like I was saying earlier, this is the food microbiology course, AGFM 2131. Um, my name is Andrew Latos. I'm the instructor for the course. And uh, just a little bit about, about the course. You, you guys are, I believe, first year microbiology, uh, first year students, and you've not taken any biology yet. Is that correct? Thanks, Don. Yeah, it looks like, uh, so this is your first intro to biology as well as microbiology. Um, we don't cover much biology. It's um, biology of eukaryotes. We cover mostly biology of small microbes in this course. And what I'd like to do is present a PowerPoint presentation for you guys. But before I do that, um, are there any pressing questions you guys have for me right now? Even before we start. Um, maybe one question that you guys might have is, what about labs? Uh, there's a Tuesday labs are scheduled, but we don't have lab tomorrow. We'll meet next week. Next week will be our first lab. Um, Amanda's got a question about labs. Good question. Question is, how do you submit the labs? The system that we had in place last semester was I set up an assignment location on my campus and you will take a carbon copy of the lab report and scan it and send that to me. So the, most of the lab reports in this course are scanned reports from um, the lab book. And there are a few formal reports. The, few, the rep formal reports come at the end of the course. So labs 10, 9, 11, or uh, sorry, uh, 8, 9, 10, I think, are the formal reports. And there is a question. Um, Will I accept photographs? I, I accept photographs. Is there a problem with other people not accepting photographs? I see somebody said there are more people waiting to get in. That's from Don. Thank you, Don, for letting me know. I don't see a problem with a photograph of your work. A photograph of your work is great because it's got, it, I can see your um, autograph on every page of the assignment. As long as it has the autograph of your, assign, uh, your name and uh, my autograph on the reports, that'll be good. Okay. Some of these things are covered in a couple of slides from ahead, I'm just looking on how do I go about showing you a PowerPoint presentation. So share screen. I haven't used Zoom yet to uh, offer a lecture. Last semester, last semester, last year, I was using the uh, program that DC Connect had, and it's a little different than this. So it's going to be a little bit of a learning situation here. So I need to see, where do I share the screen? Share screen.
And at some points, you might know more than me. <laughs> um, like right now, where do I click on in order to share a screen, to share my PowerPoint presentation? Bottom of the screen, share screen. Ah, basic desktop one. I may have to log out and log back in. Zoom will not be able to record the contents of the screen until it's quit. So I might fall out of the meeting. I may have to restart it, sorry. No, you can go and play upstairs. <laughs> You tell him, Cass. The teacher. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask somebody to be a host for a moment. Oh, let's see what somebody says here. Sebastian says, if you can see them, it can be you're in full screen. Alt S, Alt S is from Don, Alt S. Obviously, I need some technical support. Sorry, guys. Amanda says you can host. All right. So if I go back there, advanced. Did you guys use Zoom for your classes last semester? Bongo last semester, so <laughs> I see. Um, So everybody's probably having the same issues. And today's a great day to have an issue, isn't it? First day.
Okay, so in the settings, I'm looking for the Zoom settings. Share the application, share all windows from the application. I set this uh, one item, it said to hide video of people who aren't in. So I did that. Uh, okay, what does it say here? Paul says you should see an option to share screen at the bottom of the window. Yeah, I see that. You know, click meeting, select start as well. Paul, where do you see the selection for meeting? We're going to do a show and tell, okay? Everybody understand? Yes. Yo, Toby, you got muted. Also, boys and girls, I would love. Thanks for that. Maybe I can open up a file document. Let me try that. I didn't change myself as the presenter. So I think I'm still the presenter. Now, in the program Zoom, I, I shared a file with everyone, but not everybody could see that file, can you? You actually have to click on it. So that's not going to do it. Yes, we could all open it and follow along. It's kind of a strange way of doing this. I'm so sorry. Uh, Yo, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. Um, you see where I'm like highlighting the green button? I don't know how to stop it now that I started it. Okay. What does Zeus look different? Like, what can you see on mine? I see your browser and it's the Zoom window and it says click open link on the dialogue show them by your browser. Oh, okay. So you don't see like the, the Zoom meeting? Oh, I don't see your Zoom screen, no. Okay. So maybe just switch We see your browser, Neil. See your okay. browser. Yeah, I was trying to show the, the meeting so I can show them how I shared it, but I guess it doesn't show. Hmm. All right. Yeah, you can yeah. also do all like S. Um, I have an apple, so then it would be command. Or no, it wouldn't be command. You don't have like an Alt key on your computer. It's an open apple icon. So at the snail, the little share screen thing there. One participant to share at a time, multiple participants. I have a 
selected multiple participants can share simultaneously. So if you shared your screen, you might be able to do it. Oh, you want me to, to do the lecture, to screen share that? My daughter uses Apple and she just said hit control instead of alt, because you don't have alt. Control S. Uh, which shortcut letter is the one for sharing screen? Uh, I'll go ask her if it's different. One second. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> it's shift command S, Andrew. Shift command S. All right. Have you updated Zoom yet? I don't know. Let me take a look. You just make sure you've got it. Do you see this? I yes. have my preview up. Yep. Yes, we can see that now. That's good. Oh my gosh. There you go. <laughs> Shift command. I'll write that down. <laughs> wow. Something as simple as three keys. Uh, sorry, everyone. I apologize profusely. Okay, so we're in food microbiology. This is me. My name is Andrew Latos. It's my email address at the bottom of the screen. Today is January 10th. And lecture one is, um, I'm talking about a little bit about the background for the course. Background being deadlines, calendar, when lectures are, as well as when are labs, when's the reading week break, that's what is in the background. And then the first part, I do the introduction of the actual content, and then uh, third section, microorganism sources, I talked about where you can pick up microbes, and the last bit is microorganism movement. Thanks, Amy, for the shift command S, or was that? I'm not too sure who said that. It was uh, shift command S, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, just a image about of myself. I'm trying to readjust things on my screen uh, just so I can see what I'm doing. My background is analytical chemistry and microbiology. I do some re have done research in the past. This is me working in a lab at uh, Ontario Tech. In the image, you can see I'm not wearing a mask. This is probably a picture from 2019 or 2020 when I was still working full time. Uh, right now I'm looking for work part time uh, or and teaching this job, of uh, course, as my job. Um, I've taught the microbiology course for would be for three years this is my third time doing it. I think it's my third time, maybe my fourth, third or fourth time doing it. I've done research on cellulose, bones, chitin, uh, tooth bacteria. So I've done a lot of microbiology, uh, tumor, protein research, just a wide range of things. And a lot of it has been analytical chemistry and some of it has been microbiology. Um, I've taught for the college off and on since 2007. So long-time part-time instructor. If you notice my voice is a little different or uh, my, my pattern of speech is a little different, maybe it's my Western accent. I come from Alberta and I moved to Ontario in 14 or 15 years ago. I lived in the United States for six years. Um, 
the day I drove my truck across the border and uh, went into my very first store, somebody said, you're not from the United States, are you? You're, you're Canadian. So I know I have a Canadian accent. <laughs> that has been pointed out to me on numerous occasions. Um, anyway, that's not important. The important things are here are the dates of the course. There's a first day of class, first day of lab is posted there. Um, days to make changes in the course include 14th of January, 21st of January, uh, last day for course changes. You can withdraw from the course without getting a W before February 7th. First exam in the course is the 7th of February. There's three total. Um, family days the 21st of March, or sorry, 21st of February. The week after is reading week. And then your midterm grades come out during reading week. Second test is March 21st, the last day for withdrawing from the course, March 28th. And the third test is April 18th. It's a, I picked three mutton days as test days. And your grades are released at the end of April. So here's a schedule of the timetable. Um, today's, oh, today's January 10th this is the introduction day. Next week, we're talking about microbe morphology and the environments that you can find microbes in. Um, on the 24th, we talk about microscopy and food bacteria. The other topics in the course include staining microbes, culturing, counting, germs, sterilization. There's two lectures on sterilization. Um, I talk about disease, antibiotics, uh, environmental factors of growth, and also safety regulations. And that's the end of the course. I'm on. Okay, right now, I've gotten to slide six. Is everybody with me up to here? Oh, Sebastian asks where I was in the States. Um, I live in the state of Idaho, out in the western part of the country. The town I stayed in was named Moscow. People in Moscow had a very um, strong preference for its pronunciation as Moscow and not Moscow. They would say Moscow is in Russia, but that's one of the things from uh, Moscow, Idaho. The anyway, <laughs> that's where I was. Uh, it was a very lush green area. If you look at a topographical map of the southern, southwestern United States, it's kind of dry and arid, but the Palouse or um, Moscow, Idaho, it's not too far from Coeur d'Alene, Spokane. These cities are fairly green and lush. Okay, so what are the topics in lab? So labs start next week on the 18th. And there's an introduction lab. I don't know what we're talking in the introduction lab. The reason I don't know is um, they're changing the very first lab. And when I say they, I mean um, the other instructors at Durham College. They've been told that the first lab that we give people is problematic in that. Um, People, what we've done in the past is take a petri dish and just swab the environment, find out what kind of growth is on lab benches as well as in the air and what falls from the air onto petri dishes. And 
the problem with that is we're in a pandemic. If you have a petri dish, uh, you, you run the risk of also contaminating a petri dish with COVID. So you can capture live viral particles. I believe that's what the problem is. Um, The, the explanation wasn't given to me entirely, but we we have to change the first lab. So instead of the first lab, what I typically was doing was um, I've altered that lab. Instead of uh, scraping the environment, rubbing door handles, uh, rubbing the desk, squeaking out a petri dish and finding out if there's growth there, I would take vegetables, lettuce, uh, potato skins, ginger, onion, just anything from the kitchen, rub it onto a petri dish and see if there's growth. And reliably, we had tons of growth from all of our foods and vegetables. There's no lab this week, Cass, that's correct. This first lab is next week. Okay, I'm moving on to slide number seven. So if I'm sharing this properly, everybody can see the course evaluation. Can I get a, that's right, from someone? Sebastian says, correct. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. Um, so we have uh, the course evaluation. Like I said, I gave you three tests, one in February, one in March, one in April. So each represents about four to five weeks of learning. So after four weeks, there's a test, four more weeks test, four more weeks test. And then that's the final test. Each test is worth about 15%. I say about, no, each test is worth 15%. Um, I do have some take home assignments that's worth 10%. What I did last year, is I also assigned 5% to participating in class with questions. And participating in class is, I have this section where there's questions, I ask people to respond. Um, and what I did last year, and it seemed to work okay, was I would pick four people every week, and the four people would be responsible for answering the questions, and I was expecting to hear from those four people every class, other people could participate as well. You're, everybody's invited to participate, but I would select four people, especially so that I could at least hear somebody uh, respond to the questions. So that's 5%. The other, another 5% for the course um, is good lab practices. And by that, I mean, there's a list of jobs as well as practices that I expect everybody to perform when they're in the lab. And that's given to you upon successful completion of those jobs. So I may take a look at your notebook and make sure that the notebook is up to standard. Um, I may ask you to do lab cleanup. No, that's not true. I absolutely ask everybody to do a, a day of lab cleanup where at the end of the lab, they do the cleanup. Um, and then there's also a tidy up of the lab at the end where you come in the last day, it might be the 19th, I'll have to look at the schedule. And then you just um, clean up your bin, remove your lab coat, take your lab reports, anything else that uh, is miscellaneous from the lab, just take it away. The final 35% of your grade is the lab report. So there are 11 labs and I grade 10 of those labs and each of those labs gives about three and a half percent. So um, with the 10 labs, what will happen is you do, if you do 11 labs, I'll take the lowest of the labs and not count it and just 
get, award you the top 10 grades that you get in lab. Um, I could, Amanda's just posted a question about the blue lab coats. I don't know if the Whitby store actually carries the blue lab coats. Um, but yeah, I'll follow that up. The blue lab coats typically are at the Durham campus, the main site. Um, the first lab we would be a good time to pick up a lab coat. Um, lab coats are considered to be consumables as well as the lab notebooks. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Ah, Natalie says she's ordered a pack of five of the, is that the lab notebooks? Um, oh, lab, blue lab coats. I don't know if the blue lab coats you ordered from Amazon are the right ones. And the reason I say that is the material is important. Um, there are lab coats that are made of plastic and they're flammable. And since we're working in a flammable environment, um, we have, regular cotton lab coats that aren't as flammable as the plastic ones that are quickly flammable. So um, bring your lab coat. We'll see if it's one of the right ones, okay? Um, what people have done in the past is They've left their lab coats. There may be one or two left over from last year. If you're lucky, you might be able to get one of those. Um, I say lucky. In an emergency, or if you don't have a lab coat, we might be able to use one of those. The ones from the past, um, have been autoclaved, so they should be sterile. Okay, so that's slide number seven, number eight. I hear a question, go ahead. And if you have a question, go ahead, just bring it up and, or even type it if you want to. Um, okay, so here's the weekly expectations for course. Every week, like I said, I'll give you guys the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and this, these slides that I'm presenting right now, they are um, online and I'll post the PowerPoint lecture slides. Uh, hopefully I'll get them up Friday and there's not too many changes, but I should be posting them regularly every Friday. So you can kind of take a look over the weekend, see what kind of things I ask, and then get prepared for the questions. Um, I ask people who are participating in the question participation to be there that day so that I can ask them the questions. Um, there is rules on how to complete a microbiology notebook, and I ask you to follow those guidelines, like one, make a table of contents, two, number your pages, three, sign and date every page. 
Um, next, perform the lab duties for good lab practices. That's, like I said, that's like 5% of your course. Washing dishes is part of that. Lab cleanup is part of that. Keeping your area clean is important. And electronic copies of the lab reports are due at noon on Friday. So you finish the lab, you take the scanned yellow, uh, no carbon required page back home, scan it, take a picture of it, and then submit it on to the assignment area. And that's the way to do that. Okay, next page. So that was page eight, page nine. Here's a few notes. Lab start next week. And you're required to get the blue microbiology lab coat from the bookstore and what they've done is they've um, made it so that the microbiologists have to wear a blue lab coat. So the college sells a white lab coat as well. Uh, chemistry, biology, they all use the regular white lab coats. The blue one is just different because it's a different color. What they want to do is to make sure that the blue lab coats are contained to the microbiology lab. The reason is the organisms that higher level microbiology students use are what are referred to as containment level two organisms. So there's a classification of organisms uh, based on a one, two, three, four numbering. In the United States, they use BS, uh, BSL1, BSL2, BSL3, BSL4 being Biosafety level one, level biosafety level two, biosafety level four, being the most contamin uh, contagious, dangerous virus out there. But um, levels one and two are also important because level by uh, containment level one organisms are the organisms that we're using in lab, and containment level two organisms are the organisms that other classes use in lab. And because some areas may have live containment level two organisms, they don't want to get those on the white lab coats. They just want to keep the blue lab coats in the micro lab. You're not allowed to take the blue micro lab coats out of the lab. People who are instructors at the college, they send you back to the room and they give you a talking to if you have your blue micro coat from the lab out in the hall. The end of the semester, they autoclave, which is just a pressure cook. They pressure cook the lab coats to kill off the organisms that are on the lab coats. And then they discard the coats. Um, there's also the idea of a no carbon required lab book. The no carbon required lab book is the lab book where you have, can you guys see my video? Like me talking? Yes, we can see you speaking. Oh, you can see me too. So you can see me and the presentation. That's good. I have a little tiny thumbnail of you talking in the corner of the room. Yeah, I was wondering what you see. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> chat box it's all on there the ncr paper so you'll see it's just you write on one sheet and the sheet underneath will have the uh, physical imprint of what was pressed down on the top sheet and you'll also have a piece of cardboard to kind of separate every pair of pages and then what you do is just take the carbon copy, rip that out of the book, take it home and scan that. Um, question here is, are your chemistry la notebooks from last semester acceptable? Yes, they are. If you have a used notebook that you're not going to use anymore, you can bring it into the lab. But the problem is you can't take it out of the lab. So once it goes into the micro lab, the book is, stays, is going to stay there and it's going to be thrown out at the end of the year as autoclavable trash, or even trash. Okay. 
Any questions so far? You can buy another lab book or you could just use an old lab book from last year. Mr. Latos. Yeah, go ahead. It's Amanda. We were told that we needed this notebook for your class. Is that correct? That looks like it. Okay, thank you. I just opened it up. Does it has the NCR paper, the no carbon required paper, correct? There's like two number one pages. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That looks good. Thanks, Amanda. So that's that. And we're on to the next slide then. This is page eight, I believe. So let's talk about microbiology. And some people are so into microbiology, they eventually think this is a great field for me. And yes, there are microbiology courses offered on um, main campus and you get a three-year diploma just studying microbiology and you can become a person who evaluates uh, or inspects meat plants or milk plants um, invest uh, just keeping areas clean and tidy or become sterilization experts as well as experts on the various organisms um, and they love these jobs <laughs> they are good jobs you can find one uh, the, one of the main things in a science class is learning the language and part of the course is there are lots of words to learn lots of the words are made up words from people's names or words that are kind of newer because uh, you haven't been exposed to the words before. And if I can come across a example, I'll share it with you. So sometimes it's like an English course or not English, but a science language course where you, we learn the language of science as kind of um, the side note, I was helping my friend move his father's materials and um, he had a case of dictionaries. So he, his father's Chinese and he had dictionaries for translating Chinese into engineering English, Chinese into uh, the terms used in chemical engineering, the terms used in uh, from between Chinese to just actual engineering. So he had all of these science books, science dictionaries. So learning some of the language is important in order to be able to communicate our ideas. As that's the point is there's lots of words that we're gonna learn over the course of the semester. Um, today, we're gonna to learn about fomites. I don't know if you are familiar with fomites, but fomites are an interesting small topic, we'll I'll also talk about vectors, vectors and fomites. Two new words, maybe. Maybe you haven't heard them before. Maybe you have heard them before, we'll see. So here's the intro. In this slide, I say there are three domains of life. This is something that's kind of a new idea. And I say new, it's about 40 to 50 years old. Um, the way we understand that there's these three domains of life is by the DNA technology. If you're looking at the sequence of the area on the chromosome that's referred to as a 16S or an 18S ribosome, um, these little molecules are responsible for translating, transcription of the DNA and archaea, which are ancient organisms, prokaryotes and eukaryotes have different kinds of the 
DNA sequences. And because the sequences align with these groups, so in prokaryotes, the 16S subunits match. In eukaryotes, they have 18, well, they have different kinds of ribosomes. So the ribosomes of archaea match archaea ribosomes, archaea uh, prokaryote ribosomes match prokaryotes and eukaryote ribosomes match eukaryotes. So that's how scientists figured out there's three domains, not just two domain, uh, just one tree of life, but three actual domains of life. And you can find micro or microbes in all three domains. The first two domains, the archaea and the prokaryote, are single-celled organisms. Eukaryotes also have organisms that are very, very small, single cellular or um, microscopic. So the term that I'm introducing is this idea of a microbe. Microbes are microscopic organisms. Um, so there's archaea, bacteria, and bacteria are also referred to as prokaryotes. That's just a more formal name of them. Uh, there's fungi. And with fungi, the microbes are yeast and mold. Then there's larger organisms and fungi like mushrooms. But uh, we're just looking at the yeast and mold for this course. There's also protozoa and algae for eukaryotes, which are microbes. They're very, very small organisms. The next point I have, uh, this definition of microorganisms. I've read several places where they say that viruses are not microorganisms. And the reason is because micro or, or, um, viruses are not considered to be living. They do not self-replicate. And when I say self-replicate, that just means that they don't have their own machinery to make more copies of themselves. What they do is they use the machinery of other cells, co-opt that, and then they create copies based on another or, uh, cell's machinery. Definition of microorganism is that an organism like your bacteria, archaea, or fungi, that is so small, you can't see it with the naked eye. That's your basic definition of what is a microbe. Um, microbes can be beneficial. If you've had beer or wine, um, it can be enjoyable. It's also uh, very important in the manufacturing of cheeses. So if you're a fan of cheeses, then you're using microbes in some way. Um, and in fact, we think that the vast majority of microbes can be beneficial. It's just a small portion of microbes that are bad, that are not beneficial. Here's a diagram of the tree of life. It, the idea of the tree of life is that there's these three branches, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes. And they may have had a common ancestor or not. We're not exactly too sure. Uh, Sebastian's got a comment, also good for growing mushrooms. I'm not too sure I follow Sebastian. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but like I was saying earlier, viruses are not considered to be living organisms. And in this course, we look at bacteria and eukaryotes, but I do talk a little bit about archaea in one of our first assignments. I ask you to look up organisms that are archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotic organisms. 
So second, uh, next slide. Here's an image. Um, a student, his name's Craig. Craig sent me a picture the, earlier this summer, or last summer rather, just out of his organic mushroom farming book. Speaking of mushrooms, there's some people who take this course have an interest in mushrooms. And th there's even uh, in the past, People have gone on field trips to mushroom farms. It's, they've gone to field trips to mushroom farms, uh, breweries, as well as organic farms in the area. And so Craig shared this photo that there's the archaea, um, bacteria, and eukarya. And there's like three branches of life. Um, we belong in the eukaryote branch. You can see there's a little tiny word there. It says animals. Yes, we're a part of, the animals are a part of the life on this planet. <laughs> okay, next slide. Microbes. Um, microbes live on people. And they also live in people. And the microbes that live inside of us um, live everywhere from the mouth, the gums, the teeth, the tongue, uh, in the nose, there's organisms there. There's not many organisms in the lungs or stomach. If you do get a helibite, or pylori infection, you can get an ulcer from the stomach. If you're a cystic fibrosis patient, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is really bad in the lungs because you will always be uh, fighting off the phlegm that comes up from Pseudomonas. Um, so the, the lungs and stomach don't have many organisms. It's mostly a clean environment, um, but and then that's where infections can occur, arise if you do have microbes living in these areas. Um, then going down lower to the smaller intestine and the colon and the uh, uterus as well. These are areas where there's other microbes as well. So the microbes in our intestines they're really important because what they do is they take the food that we ingest and they help us break it down and provide us nutrients, whether it's in the form of uh, complex vi uh, vitamins or in the case of just physical breaking it all down. So that's inside of us. Also on our surface, um, our bodies are coated with organisms. We don't see them because they might, like I said, microscopic. How many organisms do we have? I've heard the phrase that there are more microbial cells on us and in us than there are actual human cells. So we counted up the number of human cells. The rough estimate is there's 10 times that microbes living on and in us. And what do they look like? Well, I've got a couple of pictures for you. Um, here, I'll have you a picture of a bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and an algae, and some non-living infective agents, including viruses and prions. So here's a picture of bacteria. In the top left corner of this slide, there's uh, an orange bacteria. It's in a tube shape. This is referred to as a, a rod. And this image is in yellow and orange, like a really bright orange red color. 
scientists don't actually see those colors when they take pictures of bacteria, they see black and white. So this image is a false colored image. <laughs> On the right there is a fungi, same thing, probably a false color image of fungi. So they have these um, conidia, it's like a, a stalk and a ball on top of this stalk. And in this case, the fungi are forming the filaments and spores off of the filaments. The bottom left, there's another scanning electron microscope image that has been falsely colored of a protozoa. It looks like a amoeba. And you can see the arms of the amoeba and the arms of the amoeba are wrapping around a food particle. The only true color image here is this uh, bottom right hand corner. There's algae and algae, yes, they're green. They have all kinds of shapes, all kinds of sizes. You'll see some algae in lab. So here's a couple of images of non-living forms, including your viruses as well as um, prion. The prions are difficult to see. I see I have a picture of mad cow. It's more like a tissue and, and uh, the result of the prion work is the holes that are in the tissue. They're, they're so small that it's very difficult to see them as images. Um, prions are infectious protein particles that can be passed from one organism to another organism. And in this case, the cows have the organism or not the, the uh, infective particle, the infective protein particle that they pass from one cow to another cow or from cows to humans. On the top left, we have uh, image of HIV, again, false colored image, but you can see the circular sort of geometric shape of the HIV particles. On the right there, again, a circular particle emerging from cells for COVID-19. So there's some non-living forms of organ, um, my, I, I wanna say microbe organisms, but they're not microorganisms, they're small non-living forms. Always get caught up with that. Um, there's all kinds of shapes. On the left hand side of this slide, I have a picture of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is produced by a bacteria that's in a spiral shape and they corkscrew around through blood vessels. Uh, here's a protist, a protist named euglena. We have these in the lab and they look like long leaves, like very, very slender long leaves. Then there's uh, algae, which are like green branching organisms. Um, in these three images, the Lyme disease is probably false covered image, but the euglena and the algae could actually be microscope slide pictures because they do look pretty amazing. And they look kind of like that under the slide. Um, in the bottom left corner is some soil bacteria. If this could be actinomycetes. Um, they form filaments and the filaments branch out from one microbe section to another microbe section. And this is how they kind of form a, a mat of filamentous organisms. And the final image is of yeast. And the yeast it can be found in uh, all kinds of food, beer, wine, um, kefir. It's a variety of yeasts that can be found out there. So here's a couple of pictures of non-living forms. And I've got Ebola as one. It's a typically shown off as kind of like a long string in a twisty shape. Uh, bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So that's uh, phage for vi uh, virus and bacteria being its host. 
So these viruses land on a small bacteria cell and they infect the bacteria cell. Uh, prion on the top right corner um, shows the effect of the nucleic uh, peptides that form together to form scales that cause holes inside of brain tissue. And then underneath, I have a image of the SARS and COVID virus, viroid. And you can see, again, falsely colored image, uh, the circular shape and the little pointy bits on the outside of the cell referred to as the spike proteins. Okay, next slide. So there's a bunch of shapes of bacteria, rod shape, are these tube-like shapes, circular shape, we refer to as cocci shape. Um, if you have a yeast cell, we don't refer to it as a cocci yeast cell, it's a, a bacteria are cocci shape. Um, yeast cells are orbs or spheres. And then on the left-hand side, we have spiral shapes for, ah, this, for, there's rods, bacilli, spheres for cocci, and spiral, or curved shapes for other organisms. Um, oftentimes, if you see a spiral bacteria, these are very nasty bacteria. They can cause really bad diseases, uh, at least the ones that we have studied. There might be ones out there that we haven't studied that are beneficial, but I don't know of any. Um, I only know disease-forming spiral curved bacteria. Um, Amanda's got a question. Would rabies be considered to be a prion? I think that the uh, rabies is a viroid particle, and that can be transmitted as a virus. I think it's the rabies virus. Let me write that down. You ask a good question. I'll come back with an answer for you later. And somebody may just go onto the Google, look up Wikipedia. <laughs> I can find out if uh, rabies is a virus or a prion. So how big are microbes? Like I said, microorganisms, the definition is they're micro in size. So micro refers to the distance. Um, and in metric, we have a unit of measure called the micrometer. And this is the one millionth of a meter. So you've taken a meter and you divide it up into a million parts. It's the one millionth of this meter part and microorganisms are in the micro millimeter range. So it could be 10 microbes in size or a hundred micrometers in size. And you need a microscope in order to see a microbe. You can't see microbes just by looking at a dish of bacteria um, you can't see individuals. You can see what are referred to as colonies. Microbes do form bumps on plates, and the bumps have different names and of their shapes as well. Here's a stain of a mixed culture. And if you have a mixed culture, you can have tube shapes as well as sphere shapes. And here we have the rods and the caucus. And some are pink and some are blue. And this is a, what is referred to as a differential stain. It makes one kind of organism blue and one kind of organism pink. Next slide. Here are the units of measurement. Um, you 
one micrometer, like I said, it's a millionth of a meter. If you consider that in terms of millimeters, it's one thousandth of a millimeter. So if you look at a ruler and you see a millimeter as being the distance between two tiny lines on a ruler, if you put a thousand lines evenly spaced in that little space, that would be your micrometer. Um, can you resolve a micrometer? There are rulers that you take, you put them underneath the microscope and you can actually see and measure uh, organisms based for the size like that. Um, are there smaller sizes? Well, yes, there are what are referred to as nanometers. And nanometers are not one millionth, but one billionth of a meter. So there's a thousand nanometers. So if you take one of those really small divisions that I was talking about on the microscope and you divide that into a thousand, you have a thousand nanometers. So things can get very small at the nanometer range. In the nanometer range, you can actually see um, chemical bonds, which are really, really tiny. Next slide. Again, here's a false colored image of bacteria. And what I did was I said, here's some bacteria. And this is a pin. So if you can imagine a pin, let's say this is a pin. This is the very top of the pin. You notice it gets slender to a point. And then what does that pin look like underneath the scanning electron microscope? Well, if you could zoom in so much that you just see the distance of the very tip of the pin being about 200 micrometers, then you could see that it's kind of rough and the surface is um, smooth, like it's got these lines in it because of the metal being uh, formed. But you can also have bacteria on the metal and they would show up as these little dots on the metal. At, uh, when you look at it at about 200 micrometers, if you zoom in where it's even less of a field, like 50 times into that, um, that's the second slide. And the people have falsely colored it. So the metal is purple, the bacteria are orange. So you can see the little tiny rod shaped bacteria kind of pop out now. And you can match this image with the image on the left. At the very tip, you can see there's kind of a small area there that the bacteria are showing up like that. And then finally, if you take a look at some of those bacteria, zoom in on them so that you're only looking at one micrometer in diameter, you can see that they're very sausage shaped, rod like shaped organisms. And I've looked at this uh, image before, at the falsely colored image, and looked at the source. And then I went to the original source and included the picture. So you can see what they actually viewed on the screen. And then see that what they'd had to do is they'd had to falsely color the back and um, the, the metal and the bacteria just to kind of give you the idea of what is there. Next slide. Here's a size comparison. So it's an um, exercise to examine things at a very, very small level at the picometer range, nanometer range, what is at the picometer range? You've got your chemical bonds. If you have something at uh, one nanometer, you can actually resolve DNA molecules at one nanometer. At 100 nanometers, you can maybe see viruses. At one, excuse me, micrometer, you can actually resolve bacteria. At 10 micrometers, you can still see bacteria, but they'd be very, very small but your eukaryotic cells then start showing up. And then it goes up to one millimeter. And at a millimeter, you can see 
multicellular organisms, worms, ticks, insects of all sorts. Okay, here's a area for you guys to give me answers. So just ask, what's a microbe? Right, microbes carry out important functions. Um, and Matthew's got it that they're microscopic, and by microscopic, they can't be seen by the naked eye. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, all three of you. Okay, that's the first question. Next question. Are there more harmful microbes than there are beneficial microbes? And Amanda's reporting that there are more beneficial than there are harmful. Um, we believe that's the case. And can anybody name me an example of a beneficial microorganism, especially for food science? Yeast. Thank you, Paul. Next slide. Okay, can you name me four different types of microorganisms? And it's just four different types, four classes of organisms. Danielle's got bacteria, Amanda says viruses, algae, protozoa, and Jen says fungi, and the correct answer is protozoa, algae, fungi, bacteria, and also archaea, um, but it's, uh, it, there's more than four classes, but we have the four different kinds of microbes. Um, and we're trying to avoid saying that viruses are microorganisms because they're not a living organism. They are microscopic, but they're not an organism. Okay, next slide. What units are used to measure microorganisms? Oh, I've already typed the answer. <laughs> Ah, uh, oh well, okay. I thought he deleted the, uh, what does the upside down U represent? I, I'm not too sure if you see what I'm seeing. Um, Amanda says micro, correct. So in Greek, the letters alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and so on uh, lead up to micro. And this is the letter for micro. There's also the letter pi, which is like uh, two sticks with a line on top. 
most of you have seen pi this theta rho omega like the 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 omicron what letter is omicron micron micro maybe Is Omicron the formal name of micro? I am not sure. I'll write that down as a question. <laughs> Follow-up question for next class. Okay, so that's, uh, thanks guys. That's microorganism, uh, that's an introduction to microbiology. Um, just that there's three domains of life. Microbes have different shapes. There's bacteria, fungi, archaea, uh, algae, like several different kinds of microbes out there. So what are the sources? Where do they come from? This is the next section. And the last section is how do they move around? So sources of microbes, you can find them essentially everywhere. Microbes can be in the air, they can be in water, they can be soil. And importantly for us, this is food micro, so it's in food as well. It's also important that it's inside of our, inside, inside of us. Um, when I say air, microbes can live in the air or exist in the air, but they don't propagate in the air. There's not enough nutrients or moisture in, well, there could be moisture, but there's not enough nutrients for microbes to propagate in the air, but they can survive in the air. Yeah. Air can, can have uh, bacteria, fungi, spores, viruses, algae, protozoa cysts. And like I was saying, it's not a natural environment because, um, I gave the explanation. They can't propagate there. But it is a way for microbes to move from one place to another. And here's a picture of somebody sneezing. Microbes from the upper respiratory tract can be discharged by laughing, singing, talking, sing, sneezing, exerting yourself coughing, there's all kinds of ways for you to exchange the microbes. Um, droplets from your cough are very important to monitor because a cough has enough moisture for the microbe to survive uh, in the air for a limited period of time. Uh, if there's droplets that have lots of microbes in them, these microbes eventually fall and land on places. In the air, some microbes can survive for a really long time as dust. And one um, really important thing to note is conidia, which are the spores from Fungi are all around us. You could uh, grab a petri dish, leave it out in the open, and just let it sit there for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes of being exposed to the air, you will get fungi growing on your uh, petri dish. Um, there's also, if you have a piece of bread that's moist on the counter long enough, it will grow something from the canidia for the canidia for will land on the bread, form some uh, bacteria or sorry, fungi. And you've seen this in several instances, probably. We, most of us would have seen moldy bread by now. And you can see that there's different colors and different styles of mold as well. 
and they can just be floating around in air. And how would you kind of move these microbes around? Well, like I was saying, the microbes fall down as dust. All you have to do is kick up the dust. And so how do you disturb the dust, either by sweeping or cleaning? You can remove the dust, vacuum it away, or put it into a pile and sweep it out. But when you're sweeping, you're also generating some dust as well. So in the soil, there's lots of microbes. A soil has both harmful and beneficial microbes. Um, microbes are responsible for degrading material. They take slower than fungi, but they form a very important um, recycling portion of the environment. Fungi break things down quickly and bacteria break things down slowly. Um, the nutrients from breakdown are more fully degraded when it's fungi, but when it's uh, bacteria, they may create a larger soup of nutrients after they're done with the, um, the environment. In the soil I have here, mold and bacteria are the most common microbes present in soil. And soil provides nutrients for the microbes to let them grow and live. Water, water is important as well because Almost all living life requires water, free water to uh, survive. And water has to be free of any disease in order to not spoil. And water allows microbes to be transported from one stop to or one location to another. You can find bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, and viruses in the water easily. Here's some pathogens. I haven't given you the term pathogen. A pathogen is a microbe that's infectious and can cause disease. So there are these disease-causing organisms. And here's the name of two of them. For example, if you don't treat water properly, you could have a pathogen like Salmonella typhi. You could have Escherichia coli. I should have spelled that out in full name. Or Vibrio cholera, because I have here E. coli. Um, in scientific terminology, the first time we present the name of an organism, we spell it out in total. And the second time we present it, we can shorten it, so I've shortened it already, but it should be the full name there. My apologies. Um, other organisms that can cause disease include Vibrio cholera. Uh, you've heard of the disease cholera. Um, my background is Polish. My grandfather, his swear word, that he would just be like, if he was really angry at somebody, he would say cholera. And that's just like a really bad diarrheal discharging disease. So he would, that would be his swear word was cholera. So other languages use <laughs> uh, the names of diseases as their swear words. Um, people who have typhoid or cholera or even an E. coli infection can pass or die due to the um, infection that they get from the disease. 
later on in the semester, we do talk about E. coli infection at the water treatment plant in Walkerton. And we also talk about um, Salmonella typhi in a case uh, from a woman who spread typhoid fever to a lot of her, uh, a lot of the people who ate her cooking. So she was a maid. We talk, call her Typhoid Mary. Ah, Natalie. Yes, that's right. And Robert says uh, his grandpa had the same swear word. What language was that? Just, it, it, you can answer it if you want to. I'm just curious. <laughs> yes, Typhoid Mary, we talk about a little later in the course because we learned about contact tracing through Typhoid Mary. So that's water being a source of disease as well. Next slide. Um, food is also a source of pathogens or bacteria. And the food we eat comes from plants or animals. And plants and animals both can have organisms. If you're not careful with your slaughtering of uh, cattle, pigs, chicken, you can contaminate the meat with the organisms from their intestines. So this is a really important step in the um, slaughter of animals is that you have to keep things clean. There are microbes that are very desirable. Uh, you've probably heard of this term probiotics, probiotics being um, bacteria or fungi that are good to ingest because they help us with our um, nutritional needs as well as the breakdown of food. And lactobacillus is a really important one. Lactobacillus is made up of uh, two parts there, lacto being the sugar from milk, as well as bacillus being the, uh, bacillus is another word for rod shaped. So it's a milk sugar rod. <laughs> and Paul is uh, given a link to everyone. Here are some Russian swear words we need to know. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, here are some microbes that are not desirable. At the bottom, there's Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli. Uh, Salmonella is uh, very important with the handling of chicken meat as well as eggs. Listeria being a disease that's very important to the meat and cheese industry because this organism survives cold weather. And then there's E. coli, which can be an intestinal organism, and then spoilage bacteria. Next slide, humans. Uh, typically, when people are born, they don't have a large number of microbes on or in them, but within a few weeks uh, or days, the babies do get uh, exposed to enough microbes that the intestinal flora gets colonized by microbes. And you can always tell, um, apparently, and I don't know this, but 
newborn baby poop doesn't have a much of a smell, but after a couple of days, it gains its smell. Um, the smell comes from the microbial degradation by the gram negative rods bacteria like E. coli. And so uh, the E. coli is becoming colonized inside of their guts. So, and the E. coli is really important to develop nutrients and um, get food from, break down food. So when the baby's developing, they start off with very few microbes, but the microbes do increase as time goes by. Not only do the babies get them on their skin, but they also get them inside of their respiratory tract, inside the nasal, as well as the mouth, as well as in the gut. Next slide, it's estimated that there's approximately 10 trillion bacterial cells on or inside of a human. Um, it should include fungi cells. And the word for that, the cells that are on and inside of you is the microbiota. So here's another word for a def definition is what is the microbiota? The microbiota are the organisms that live on the skin on the inside of the mouth, as well as your respiratory tract or gastrointestinal tract. Um, areas that are free of microbes include musculatures, like the, the muscles don't have microbes in them, but and as well as the circulatory system, the blood typically does not have microbes. Um, when the blood has microbes, you can get sick with sepsis, and that's a really very serious disease because it's very difficult to clear up. Um, and then the lungs are also in, usually microbe free. If they're contaminated with microbes, then you have a chest infection frequently. Okay, so that's human. Here's an image. Um, it says here there are 350 different kinds of bacteria in the large intestine and 600 microbe, different kinds of microbes in your mouth. That's an old number. That number could be uh, from four or five years ago. That estimate may have increased 10 times by now. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the actual number is, I haven't been keeping up with the current literature, but there's lots there, hundreds of, and maybe thousands of different kinds of bacteria, and maybe even more, depending on who you are. So here's a slide showing you some of the organisms that are there. So in your stomach, you sometimes have lactobacillus, um, breaking down milks, in the small intestine, you have lactobacilli as well as enterococci, enterococci being um, sphere-shaped bacteria in the intestine. And then there's the large intestine. And in the large intestine, you have lots of organisms, enterobacteria, uh, E. faecalis, Bacteroides, Bifidobacterium, Bifidobacterium, yep, yeah. um, and so on. So here's a couple of pictures. Here's a picture of inside of the nasal cavity. You have tissue that forms these tendrils, and in this image. What they've done is they've taken a uh, tissue and looked at it underneath the microscope and underneath the microscope, you can actually see these spheres of bacteria. Uh, slide B shows uh, bacteria from the tissue of your stomach. So they've taken a cut section of the stomach and 
along the lining, you can see bacteria colonizing against the surface of the back of the stomach. And the third image is of, um, again, these little outward facing protrusions attaching to bacteria. Um, in many cases of bacteria, bacteria form on surfaces. They form or they survive in these in-between layers where it goes between solid to liquid. They're at the interface of solid and liquid. Um, between air and mucosa, they're at the interface of the air mucosa level. They're like at the edge of things, oftentimes. Okay, here's questions for everybody. Can you name two sources of microorganisms? Air, water. It's Danielle, Adam, Natalie. Thanks, guys. Excellent. That's. You could also put down food, soil. Yeah. There's several different sources for microbes. Next question. Let's say you're working in a food processing plant. How could dust be disturbed? It's the most simple question. Excellent. Amanda, yep, that's correct. Has anybody worked in a factory? Matthew has. Uh, have you ever had to clean equipment by blowing it down? No? Um, I worked in a lumber mill. They provided us with the headphones as well as goggles and masks, um, and what you do is you take pressurized air and just spray all of the sawdust down. So blowing stuff down is a great way of cleaning stuff. It's also a great way of making tons more dust blow around. The bindery is at a bookmaking factory. Not familiar with that. Making catalogs, huh? Cool. Okay, so that's uh, dust and how can dust be distributed? Last question, are microorganisms able to reproduce in air? Okay, Noam says, no. Why? So you're correct. The answer is no. There's not enough moisture. And Brooklyn, you're Answers there. I see. Okay. Is he is no in the class, or is it he not in the class?
Ah, I see. Okay. We're done with that question. Next question. Uh, what's a pathogen? So we took who says disease causing microbe. That's correct. A microbe that causes diseases, pathogens. All right. So that's a couple of questions. Uh, oh, here's another good one. What is the micro human microbiota? Gen has bacteria found inside the human body. It can be also fungi. I know I didn't put that in the definition, uh, but yes, the bacteria found inside the body, but even more on the body, like Paul and Danielle are saying. Thank you. Yeah, so let's see organisms on and inside of us. So that's what a microbi uh, microbiota are. That's the human microbiota. There are microbiota for every organism, for example, a tree microbiota, grass microbiota, uh, grassland microbiota. It's the different kinds of microbiota depend on what you're studying. Okay, next slide is microorganism movement. How do microorganisms go from one place to another place. Um, I see I have only eight minutes left of class. So let's go through the three ways, three methods of traveling from one spot to another, that you can contact a microbe. Um, we have this way of using the word vehicle a vehicle just simply means a non-living way that a microbe can move from one place to another. And then there's vectors. Vectors are um, the movement by other living organisms. So let's take a look at these three. First is contract transmission. So if you're directly in contact um, by maybe droplets or hand-to-hand. -hand. That could be a contact transmission. So person-to-person, dog-to-dog, cat-to-cat, mouse-to-much, mouse. That would be direct contact transmission. Example, sex, touching, kissing, handshaking, um, the flu, cold, and staph infections, all different ways of catching these pathogens. A really important word for contact transmission is the word fomite. A fomite is a non-living object that um, once in contact with you, can transfer microbes from one place to another. An example could be a tissue. And this is why you always throw Kleenex tissues into the trash as because of it can hold the microbes um, and you want to dispose of anything that holds microbes. The same thing with handkerchiefs, bedding, door handles, money. These are all different ways that uh, a 
non-living organism can transmit bacteria through contact transmission. So the word is fomite, and it's just a non-living object that can move microbes from one place to another. You can also spread colds and flus this way. There's also droplet transmission. So the microbes from snapping, sneezing, singing, droplets can move a meter from person to person and uh, sneezes can, you, I showed you the picture of someone sneezing, this cloud of droplets. Um, and diseases can include whooping cough, pneumonia, and influenza. Then there's this term, vehicle transmission. So the first one was contact transmission. The second way microbes can move is by a vehicle or a medium. And the medium, three mediums here are given water, food, or air. So the bacteria could be in the water and traveling in the water and the person can get sick by ingesting the water. Another way is by food. So food comes to you and you can get sick by the food or air. The air can have microbes in it as well. Uh, and so here I'm talking about water with the examples of cholera, typhoid, shigella. And I'm just going to go very, very quickly through a couple of these because I want maybe two minutes just to wrap up at the end. Um, there's food, could diseases like tapeworm, listeriosa, salmonella. And then there's air uh, that could transmit disease. And examples can be tuberculosis or colds or mold um, can also be traveling through the air. Okay, and the final term that I wanted to share with you guys today, vectors. Vectors are biological organisms that carry pathogens. So there's two different ways of spreading by vectors. One is by mechanical transmission. So this is a special way of saying contact transmission, mechanical transmission by vector. So someone's got a disease and they come in contact, the disease is on them. They come in contact with another person. They are the vector by which the disease is spread. So a vector is something that carries disease. So here's a really uh, famous example, uh, Lyme disease is transmitted by ticks. You may have heard of the people in summertime getting worrying about ticks. Ticks, uh, tick bites can have bacteria in them and the bacteria can infect the blood. The blood infection gets bad and the people become so badly infected, they lose um, all kinds of abilities, and that's a transmission by a vector. Insects are common vectors. People can be vectors. Here's another example. Malaria is a, a vector transmitted by mosquitoes. If a smoker touches a tobacco leaf, the smoke, the Tobacco uh, mosaic virus from one tobacco leaf that he smoked can get onto his hands and can also then be transmitted into another tobacco plant. Okay, that's where I want to end it today. I know that uh, I've been recording this lecture, and the idea is that I should post this as well. Um, and that's what I'll do. I'll find where it is on the hard drive and post it onto YouTube. And uh, I'll make a YouTube channel called AGFM 2131 with, I'm not exactly, exactly sure how to name it, but it'll be something like AGFM 2131, maybe 2022. 
If you look online uh, for AGFM 2021, I have a couple of videos already there from two years ago when I did this course. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> or was it three years ago now? Two, no, it's, sorry, it's two years. That was the beginning of the pandemic. So this is like I said, I'm happy to be your instructor. You guys have any questions? Talk to you again next week. And remember, lab is next week. If I hit stop share, ah, I see I have four people left in class yet Jackie, Matthew, Tabechku, and Robert. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Yep. Nice meeting you, Jen, too. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. I'll end the recording soon.